not in a kindly way like Henry Strunk, but always in a morally reproving way. Now, the first circuit seems to have been known to our ancestors and projected outward as the moon goddess, the great white moon goddess with their three aspects, and that's why the first day of the week in almost all European languages is named after the moon goddess. Monday in English, Montag in German, Lunace in Spanish. I did this in Amsterdam once with a very multilingual class. We worked our way all around Europe, and it's always the day of the moon goddess, which is the mother symbol, the mm. all-providing breast. And Tuesday is Martes uh, in Spanish. It's always named after a war god because it deals with the territorial circuit. Martes, it's always Mars. Mm. Tis was an ancient Anglo-Saxon war god that Tuesday is named after. And so we got our, the moon goddess and the war god, and the next day is Votenstag, or Wednesday, or Merkele is named after the god of communication. And that circuit is activated when we first begin to realize all the noises the adults making are a code, and we learn to de decipher it, and we begin to be able to communicate. And this I call the time-binding circuit in honor of Alfred Korzybski. Leary called it the laryngeal manual circuit. It has to do with making speech units that communicate to others and manipulating the world with your hands. Uh, you build a model made out of words or other symbols, then you test it by manipulating the world and see if the world fits your model. You do that just naturally and instinctively. It's a genetic program until you get to school where they train you to lose all your curiosity and just memorize the correct answers the teachers give you. Every child is intensely curious until they get to school. And the function of school is to kill the curiosity by telling them there's one correct answer and we know it already and don't do any thinking of your own. They stop that by the time you reach the college level and they, and they allow you to begin thinking then, unless you go to a Catholic college. So the third circuit is kind of a thinking circuit. Yeah, it's uh, in terms of Jungian psychology, the first circuit is sensation, the second circuit is feeling, and the third circuit is reason. And Freudian, it's the oral stage, the anal stage, and the latency period. Anyway, with the third circuit, we have a, a revolution. The first two circuits tend to be basically conservative. They keep repeating the same patterns over and over throughout history. That's the major theme of Finnegan's Wake, how these first two circuits throughout history continue to produce the same patterns over and over. Cain and Abel, Napoleon and Wellington, it's all the same story. It's always the two brothers trying to kill each other. This is an evolutionary relative success for most mammals and most vertebrates, as a matter of fact. But the third circuit, by letting the information be transmitted across generations, creates this information acceleration, which gets faster and faster as it goes along. Kozybski called that the time-binding function, and he said it's what differentiates people from other mammals. And once you get into the verbal and symbolic world, if you only learn words, you stay in one reality tunnel or belief system. And I always abbreviate belief system as a BS, a very, I think a very useful abbreviation mm -hmm. coined by my friend David J. Brown. When you learn mathematics, you find there's a variety of symbol systems. If you can think in both words and mathematics, you got a lot more freedom than people who only think in words. If you're good at visualizing, you have another semantic circuit that word people don't have. Einstein, for instance, considered a great mathematician, said all of his ideas came to him as images first, then he got the equations, and the third step was getting the words to explain the equations. This acceleration of information leads to faster and faster change, which is very disagreeable to the people in high positions of authority who have this burden of omniscience that they're supposed to be doing all the thinking, perceiving, smelling, sensing, hearing for the whole society because everybody else is just supposed to follow orders. With this burden of omniscience and information doubling all the time, they get more and more out of contact with objective reality in the sense of what's going on in the sensory, sensual, space-time continuum. And so they more and more are making their decisions based on the basis of things they learned when they were in college 40 years ago. 
or things they heard from older politicians before they got into it. And everybody's afraid to tell them when they're wrong because that's the way you get a pink slip and wind up on the unemployment lines. <laughs> So we got the acceleration factor of information and the deceleration factor of the authoritarian structure, which doesn't like the acceleration factor and keeps trying to slow it down. And that, to me, is the basic dialectic of history, information attempting to break free and ruling elites trying to stop the flood of information from unseating them and creating a world they can't manage because they can't understand. So back to uh, Circuit 3, how does that affect us personally? Well, it gives us the capacity to perpetual learning and perpetual intake of new information and transformation of ourselves and our societies. And it also tends to trap us in the cocoon of our favorite symbolism so that we can't think outside that. Then our BS or our belief system becomes a set of blinders which keeps us from letting any new signals in. If you're talking about abortion and somebody keeps saying baby killers, <laughs> you can't get anywhere because they have created a semantic grid in which the fetus is by definition equal to a baby. And nobody has claimed this that about any other species. Nobody claims that an acorn is an oak tree or an egg is a hen. But for some reason in the human class of life, the, the fetal form is equivalent to the post-birth form. I think that's one of the more remarkable metaphysical ideas floating around in our society. So you were saying that the... Um First circuit gives us a forward-backward orientation, and the uh, second circuit gives us an up-and-down orientation. Is that correct? Yeah. And so this third circuit orients us The third us circuit seems to correlate with the fact that the majority of the population uses the left brain much more than the right brain and uses the right hand much more than the left hand. The left brain is connected to the right hand. The right brain is connected to the left hand. And this creates a basic left-right polarity in our thinking. And when you put together the forward-back of the oral biosurvival circuit, the up-down of the anal territorial circuit, and the right-left of the time-binding circuit, you got three-dimensional space, which is the first type of space mathematically organized by Euclid or somebody writing under the name Euclid or somebody earlier that Euclid ripped off or whatever. And that seemed to be the only real space up until the 19th century when mathematicians discovered other kinds of space. The reason it seems like the only real space is because it's the way our nervous system stacks information. And that's why the third day of the week is the day of the god of communication, Mercury or Votan, as the case may be. So where do we go on the fourth day of the week or in the fourth circuit? Well, Thursday, Thortag, so he's a thunder god and a father god. This is the domestication circuit. This is the sociosexual circuit. At puberty, the DNA, which has been sending out RNA messenger molecules, making changes every day of your life probably, but at puberty it sends out a whole bunch of new RNA messenger molecules, your whole body changes. And since the mind and the body are one system, the organism as a whole, the nervous system and all of its links to the endocrine and the muscular and other systems, suddenly you find yourself the bewildered possessor of a, of a new body and a new personality to, for whom the only important question in the universe is where do I get laid? <laughs> And that, that remains the most important question until you're in your 40s, at least, sometimes until you're in your 80s, I hear. And uh, to show how imprinting works on the fourth circuit, there's a case in Masters Johnson, human sexual dysfunction, a guy who was about to make out for the first time in his life in the back seat of a car. At the crucial moment, a cop flashed his light in the window and said, what are you two doing in there? And this guy remained impotent until he arrived at the Masters Johnson Clinic for re-imprinting. They managed to re-imprint him and create normal male potency. But he was impotent for, I think it was 20 years before he showed up at the Masters Johnson Clinic. And we all tend to have our own favorite sexual profile, depending on the incidents around our initial orgasm and mating experiences. Ergo, we all seem a little bit queer to one another. I call the fourth circuit the guilt circuit because every society has its own sexual rules. 
whatever tribe you are born into, you got to learn the local sexual rules and obey them, or at least pretend to obey them, or if you can't obey them, try not to get caught. Most people do not have exactly the imprint desired by their societies. Most people spend most of their time trying to conceal from their neighbors what their actual sexual life is like. So the Fourth Circuit determines uh, how we deal socially. How we deal with social and sexual relations. And of course, if your imprints and conditioning are very close to what society demands, you'll have a happy life. If they're a little bit off kilter, you will consider yourself neurotic, and anybody who realizes your problems will consider you neurotic. If they're way off kilter, you're not neurotic anymore, you've become a goddamn pervert. <laughs> Meanwhile, you're stuck with these imprints and these genetic programs and so on and all the things that are going to make up our personality.